Now that we've talked about the electromagnetic spectrum, here's the question I now want to address. What's so special about visible light versus all the other forms of electromagnetic radiation? So you might say, what do you mean what's so special? All right, here's what I mean by what's so special. If there's all these different types of electromagnetic waves, right? There's gamma rays and x-rays and radio waves and microwaves and ultraviolet rays and infrared and visible light. There's only one type that living things can detect or perceive, visible light. All right, in other words, if I had a chunk of radioactive uranium and it was giving off gamma rays, would you see the gamma rays? Would you hear the gamma rays? Would you even know the gamma rays are being emitted or given off? <coughs> no. Are there radio waves in this room? You know there are because you turn on a radio and pick up the radio wave signals. But can you feel the radio waves? Are you aware of them in any form? All right, when you turn on a microwave machine, can you see the microwaves coming out? No. So, in other words, of all these different types of electromagnetic waves, only visible light is the only one that living things can perceive or feel or detect, see in some way. So that's what's unique about, uh, we want to address what's unique about visible light. The first point, the less important point, is that the, uh, we said earlier that the, uh, all stars, including our sun, emit or give off all forms of electromagnetic waves. So our sun gives off gamma rays or cosmic rays. It gives off x-rays, radio waves, uh, ultraviolet rays, infrared, and as well as visible light. 40%, almost half of all that solar radiation, meaning electromagnetic radiation from the sun, comes off as visible light. So that's almost half. But the really important thing is, as I was just saying, visible light radiation can excite electrons in certain organic molecules without breaking these molecules apart. Let me put it to you this way. Uh, on, our, on our electromagnetic diagram right here, back on G4, so we have this really high frequency, high energy electromagnetic waves and very low frequency, low energy. You know the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears? You remember how Goldilocks tried the porridge and one was too hot and one was too cold and one was just right? Uh, any type of electromagnetic waves that have a higher frequency level than visible light are too hot and they shatter the organic molecules in a living thing. They break them. On the other hand, any type of electromagnetic waves that are lower frequency than visible light essentially are too cold and have no effect on the organic molecules in a living thing. So, so th these destroy living things and these have no effect. Visible light is just right. It's like the porridge that had, it was just the right temperature, not too hot and not too cold. It has enough energy to excite the electrons in certain organic molecules and living things so that they can be aware of its presence, but not so strong that it shatters the organic molecules and yet not too so, so cold that it has no effect. Does everybody follow that? So that's what I wrote back on G1. We wrote on G1 that infrared, for example, doesn't have, cause any electron excitement. It has no effect on organic molecules. Ultraviolet rays, however, already start to shatter and break organic molecules, causing your skin to burn and causing skin cells to become cancerous. So it's harmful. It's too hot. Infrared is too cold. So visible light is just right. Let's see how this works by looking at page uh, G3. On page G3, so on page G3, we know that chlorophyll is the molecule that absorbs uh, light energy in plants. That's what we're talking about right now. Is we got onto this in terms of plants, but we're going to talk about vision in just a moment because it's very similar. All right, this is a chlorophyll molecule. It says it right down here, the structure of chlorophyll. It is a complex organic molecule. 
you'll notice that right here in the center of this uh, chlorophyll molecule is the atom magnesium. It's a magnesium atom. And what happens is that light energy, not, it, it's not so hot that it would shatter this molecule, and it's not so cold that it would have no effect on this molecule. It has just enough energy to excite electrons in the magnesium atom of that chlorophyll molecule. Let's see how that works. So here it shows an atom on the right. This represents this magnesium atom, and it's got an electron. It's got more than one, but it's got electrons orbiting around the nucleus. If you've forgotten the structure of an atom, go back and review section C. You start to understand why we talked about atoms. Here it shows light energy. Notice that the light energy causes the electron to move to a different orbit. So literally what's happening is that the light energy is being absorbed by that electron, causing it to move to a higher energy <coughs> orbit, uh, orbital level. So by absorbing that light energy, it causes the electron to move to a higher orbit. So in a sense then, some of this light energy has been, in a sense, captured by this molecule because that energy has now made that electron move to a different orbit. If that electron drops back down to its original orbit, it gives off that energy. So this is the way that that light energy has been absorbed uh, by this molecule. So now we're trying to get a sense of how chlorophyll absorbs light energy. It absorbs the light energy, which causes the electrons in the magnesium atom of the chlorophyll to move to a higher orbital level. And now this energy that's been absorbed can be used for purposes called photosynthesis. Now, the, uh, back on page G1, now that we've explained how chlorophyll works, now I want to ask the question, letter D, do all wavelengths of visible light excite electrons in the chlorophyll molecule. You might say, what does that mean? We know that light comes in different frequencies or colors, different wavelengths or frequencies. There's violet and blue and uh, green and yellow and orange and red. Will all the colors of the rainbow be absorbed by the chlorophyll molecule? All right? So some of us might say no, some of us might say yes, a lot of us are saying, I don't know. Some say, I don't care. All right? So let, let's, let's see uh, how this works. Turn to page G5. That's what we wrote, CG5. So on page G5 is a graph. This is a graph, and we'll explain it. First off, graphs always have what's called an x-axis and a y-axis. You learn that like in math classes and stuff like that. On the x-axis are the different colors of light. Violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. Okay, the different colors of light, light energy. Now, on the y-axis, it says light absorption. To what it says, how much of the light is being absorbed. We've explained that when a molecule absorbs light energy, uh, it's actually causing electrons to move to different orbits. Now, this graph shows several chemicals. I want to focus on the, uh, the graph line labeled chlorophyll. And this is the one that I've made a thicker black line. And here's what this graph is showing. It is indicating to what extent the different colors of light are absorbed by chlorophyll, exciting it to the, what extent chlorophyll absorbs different colors of light energy. You'll notice that it looks like chlorophyll absorbs a lot of the violet blue light. But look what happens in terms of green and yellow. Can everybody see that chlorophyll doesn't seem to be absorbing green and yellow? It does absorb orange and red. Does everybody follow that? Mm -hmm. So chlorophyll looks like it absorbs violet and blue light. It, absor it doesn't absorb green or yellow. And it does absorb orange and red, not quite as powerfully, not as much as violet blue. 
Now, let me explain something. When a molecule, a, a molecule either absorbs a certain color of light, if it doesn't absorb that color of light, you know what it does? It reflects it right back at you. Ah. So the reason why chlorophyll looks green is it's reflecting green light. It doesn't absorb it. Now you know why chlorophyll looks green, and that's why plants that contain chlorophyll look green. It's absorbing all the other colors, the violet and blue, and the orange and red. Let's look at a different example on this graph. There's a chemical called carotene. Carotene is the chemical that's in carrots. And we all know what color carrots are, right? Right, when you eat them, things that Bugs Bunny eats. Let's look at the colors of light that carotene absorbs. Carotene absorbs violet and blue and green and yellow. Does everybody see that? But does, it, does carotene absorb orange or red? No. no. So if it doesn't absorb orange, what does it do with orange? It reflects it, and that's why the carotene in a carrot makes a carrot look orange. So now you're starting to understand how color works. <clears throat> so uh, this, this is applicable to everything. So this bag here, all right? So, you know, the, a lot of the stuff that we have, our clothes and so on, has been dyed with organic molecules, all right? So this was dyed with an organic molecule. White light being, being emitted from the light bulbs, it contains all the colors of the rainbow. I think many of you knew white light contains all the colors. So when white light strikes this pigment that this uh, bag has been dyed with, it, this pigment in this bag absorbs all the colors except red. And that's what it reflects right back at you. And that's why it looks red. So now we can explain. So the same thing with the reddish, uh, uh, orangish uh, uh, sweatshirt. And uh, 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 looking for any other colors, there's a green sweatshirt right back there. Right? And this gentleman has a green sweater. So that means that all, it's absorbing all the colors but reflecting green, just like chlorophyll. But now we've got to ask the question, what about, what about something that looks like this? This piece of paper. So if white light contains all the colors of the rainbow and it strikes this paper, you know what this paper is doing? It's reflecting all the colors of the rainbow. So it looks white. On the other hand, if we have something that looks, no, all right, Do I, can I use you? Okay, all right, so we have a, a, a black sweater here, all right, so here comes white light containing all the colors of the rainbow. Uh, what's, what's the pigment doing in this sweater? It's absorbing all the colors. It's not reflecting any and it appears black, because it's not reflecting any colors. Now, let's take this one step further. Isn't this interesting? Right, now, now, uh, now if, um, if we say that something that appears white is reflecting at light energy, all the colors of light energy, and something that appears black is absorbing all the colors of visible light energy, then we might predict that something that's absorbing all that light energy might become warmer than something that's reflecting all the colors of light energy. So if you were walking barefoot on a hot day, and you have a choice of walking on the white cement or the black asphalt, is there a difference in temperature? Yes, yes the black asphalt is absorbing all this light energy, and the white cement is reflecting much of, much of that light energy. And that accounts for their difference in temperature. This is also why people who live in hot places will generally wear white clothes to reflect light energy. So when we think of Arabia and all these other places, they wear white clothes. Whereas, you know, if you're living in a cold place, you put on a dark coat because whatever light energy, it'll absorb light, that light energy. All right, so this is how this works. So now you understand when a child asks this crazy question, Mommy, why is grass green? <laughs> it's a wonderful question, and now you should be able to explain. You'd say, well, they're not going to understand that. I don't think it's that complicated to say that 
that uh, the white light contains all the colors. In fact, what a, uh, a, you can actually take the white light, and, uh, white light and break it into all the colors of the rainbow. That's what a glass prism does. And we actually, uh, I think I have a picture of a glass prism. Uh, yeah, on the bottom of G4, a glass prism at the bottom of G4 will break apart white light into all the colors of the rainbow. But, in fact, after it rains, there are these little droplets of water in the air. And as the sunlight hits those water droplets, the water droplet acts like a prism. And it breaks apart the white light, the sunlight, into the colors of the rainbow, creating a rainbow. That's how a rainbow is created, is the droplets of water that are still floating in the air right after a, 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 a rainstorm. As the light starts to come through the clouds, uh, the uh, droplets of water break the, uh, the white light into all the colors of the rainbow, creating the rainbow effect. So uh, all you have to do, it's not that complicated to say, that any object either absorbs certain colors of light or reflects certain colors of light, and what it reflects is, uh, it determines what color it looks to us as we look at it. All right, It's not that complicated, but that way we understand what's going on. So, back on page G1. Back on G1. So, here's what I wrote. On the question, do all wavelengths of visible light excite the electrons in the chlorophyll, we've learned that any molecule absorbs certain colors of light, and reflects the others. It even, what it doesn't absorb, it reflects. So chlorophyll reflects green light. That's why it looks green. Now what color of light did chlorophyll absorb most? What was the favorite color of light that chlorophyll really likes to absorb? Violet. Yeah, violet blue. And those are commonly known as grow lights. So if you've ever heard of these uh, violet blue lights that you can put on plants, they love violet blue light. That's what they absorb the best, and that provides the energy for photosynthesis the best. Let's make sure we under, and, and so I also mentioned carotene. So carotene reflects orange and red light. That's, the, that's why carrots look the color they do. It's absorbing the other colors. Let's make sure we understand the significance of this. Let's imagine we had a potted plant, and we're going to place this potted plant in a closet. Now, obviously, if we put it in a closet without any light, it'll die, because plants have to carry on photosynthesis. They are autotrophs. They make their own food using photosynthesis, using sunlight. Uh, now, could we, uh, could we take that potted plant, keep it in a closet, and just keep it under an artificial white light and water it periodically. Would it live? Would it grow? No. Yeah, it would be fine. You've got plants living in your uh, home right now. That uh, Some might be by a window. You can, as long as they get enough, uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be sunlight. It could be light from a light bulb. They just need the light. Now, they're only using mostly the violet blue and the orange red. They're reflecting green light. What if we took this plant, instead of putting it under a white light in the closet, what if we put it under a blue-violet light in the closet and watered it? Will it grow? Yeah. It'll really grow, because it loves violet-blue light. That's the favorite colors of, that provide energy for photosynthesis in plants, because chlorophyll really absorbs violet-blue. All right, so it'll grow best under violet-blue. That's called a grow light. How about if we put in the closet a red light? Will the plant grow under a red light? Yes. It will grow. Not as much. It won't grow as rapidly as it would under a violet blue. But chlorophyll does absorb. It does absorb orange red. It really absorbs violet blue. Now, let's try it one more. What if we put in the closet a green light? Okay, so we're going to put a green light, put the potted plant in, in the closet under a green light, and water it. Will it grow? No, no. no, it will die. Because chlorophyll doesn't absorb or use green light. It reflects it. That's why it looks green. It doesn't use green light at all. 
So it, it can't, it doesn't use, the, so in terms of our question on page uh, G1, uh, do all wavelengths of visible light excite the electrons in a chlorophyll molecule? We now have our answer. No. All right, now, we have been talking about how chlorophyll absorbs certain colors of light, and uh, that provides, and as, as it does, as it absorbs certain colors of light, it's absorbing light energy that's used for photosynthesis that we're going to learn more about. But you might be thinking, you know, Professor Fink, I'm not a science major. I really don't care about photosynthesis anyhow. All right, so let me try something. Maybe you're interested in this. How about how we see? How does vision work? Now, you might also say, I don't care about that either. All right, so let's talk about vision because it's not all that different from photosynthesis. Let's turn back to page G5 on G5. So on G5, first let's uh, mention uh, a little bit about the eye. So uh, in the picture on the lower right, it has a front view of an eye. All right, and the black spot is called the pupil. What is a pupil? It's actually a hole. It's an opening. It is the opening through which rays of light go right through that hole or opening called the pupil. Now you might say, well, I don't feel a hole when I rub the front of my eye. I don't feel a hole. I hope not. Because, as we're going to see in a moment, there is a hard membrane called the cornea that covers the front of the eyeball. So, but if you didn't have that cornea there and you felt the front of your eye, you'd feel a hole where the pupil is. Now, surrounding the pupil is a muscle called the iris. Just so there's no mistake on this, in case you're wondering, are you going to test us on this? Of course. Everything I cover. All right? So just wanted to be clear on that. So uh, the uh, iris is a pigmented muscle. It, uh, it is a muscle that contains pigments, and it may appear blue or green or brown or hazel. And this has nothing to do with seeing. Whether you have blue eyes or brown eyes or green eyes has no effect at all as far as how you're able to see. And absolutely, just, just interesting that there's, you know, why some people have blonde hair or brown hair or black hair or auburn hair. That has no effect in terms of how they live. All right? They just, uh, that's a genetic difference as far as hair color, and there are genetic differences as far as eye color, but it has no effect as far as seeing. Just like hair color has no effect, let's say, in terms of how your brain functions. Um, the, uh, all right, so um, you'd say, what about blondes? Okay, that's a whole other story. Okay, the, all right, so, um, but it doesn't affect it. All right, so that's a pigmented muscle. And as this muscle contracts or relaxes, that changes how big or how small that opening or hole is called the pupil. So the iris is a muscle that uh, contracts or relaxes and that affects the size of that opening called the pupil. Let's look in this side view of the eye. This is a side view of the eyeball, a cutaway side view. All right, so what we see on your left side here is uh, the path of light. And the first thing that light goes through is this clear membrane on the front of the eyeball. And that clear membrane is called the cornea. So that's the second word listed, the cornea. The cornea is the name of this clear membrane, that hard membrane on the front of your eyeball. So the rays of light first go through the cornea. Now, uh, this, uh, here I colored in the iris, I made it blue, that's the muscle, the iris. All right, could have been brown, could have been green, could have been hazel. Notice the opening here in the iris, that's called the pupil, that's a hole or opening. So the rays of light go through the cornea and then right through that opening between the the iris, in the middle of the iris, called the pupil. And then right here is the lens of the eye. So the lens focuses, and the lens is labeled right up here, the lens focuses the rays of light onto the back of the eyeball. 
So here's the rays of light, and they're being focused onto the back of the eyeball. Now, at the back of the eyeball, there is a layer called the retina. What is the retina? The retina contains what are called photoreceptors. What are photoreceptors? Photo means light, like photosynthesis. Receptor means to receive. These are sensory neurons that receive light. They are sensory neurons activated by light. Activated by light. When these photoreceptors are activated by light, they will then send electrical signals out of the eyeball through what's called the optic nerve. So you'll notice that coming off the back of this eyeball is something called the optic nerve. Now a nerve is like a telephone cable. And just like in a telephone cable, there's a lot of wires. Inside the optic nerve are a lot of wires. They're not really copper wires. They are nerve cells, nerve fibers. And so these nerve fibers in the optic nerve are sending electrical signals called action potentials to the brain. So this is how your brain, it, it, your brain simply receives these electrical signals or electrical impulses and it's going to convert these electrical signals into a visual image in your mind. And of course, uh, we're all wondering, how could you convert an electrical signal into a visual image? I don't know. How does your TV set work? Doesn't it convert an electrical signal called a TV wave into a visual image? Right? So uh, it's, uh, obviously this involves the nervous system and not electronics. But it works somewhat similarly. All right, so that's, uh, the, this is how the path of light goes, and here's the photoreceptors. Now, in terms of these photoreceptors, there are two types of photoreceptors in the retina. Incidentally, in case anybody's wondering. Is, uh, is this in the book? What do you think? Of course it's in the book. And if you look in the syllabus, it'll tell you what pages are in the uh, that you can read about it. Furthermore, I've linked a number of other resources on my website. So of course, I'm not just making this up. This is all in the book. Uh, now, there are two types of photoreceptors, rod and cone photoreceptors. The rod photoreceptors and the cone, the rods are kind of rod-shaped and the cones look conical, cone-shaped. Now, let's talk about the rod photoreceptors in the retina first. The rod photoreceptors are very sensitive to light. They are very sensitive to light, but they only allow us to see in black and white and shades of gray. So under dim light, when it's dark, uh, we can still see, but it, we can't tell necessarily what color anything is, because everything is black and white and shades of gray. The cone photoreceptors allow us to see in color. It's easy to remember. Color starts with the letter C, and cone starts with the letter C. So the cones are for color vision. <clears throat> now, in order for the cones to work and allow us to see in color, we have to have a, a, a well lit. So this room is nicely illuminated, and we can make out colors like green and red and all the other colors. But if this room were dark, it would be difficult to know whether somebody was wearing a green uh, sweater or a red sweater or a blue sweater. It would just kind of look kind of some shade of gray. Now, I'll tell you more about the cone photoreceptors in a moment, but let's stay on the rod photoreceptors. So, we had said that the rays of light are going to be absorbed uh, by these photoreceptors. Actually, let's be more specific. There is a chemical in the rod photoreceptors called rhodopsin. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that the way rhodopsin works is very similar to the way chlorophyll works. Didn't we say that chlorophyll absorbs certain colors of light? Well, rhodopsin absorbs certain colors of light. And we said that when that chemical absorbs light, it's absorbing energy. So rhodopsin absorbs light energy. That's what I wrote right here. Rhodopsin is absorbing light energy. That light energy is absorbed by rhodopsin. Uh, when the rhodopsin absorbs the light energy, 
That's what triggers an electrical impulse, an electrical signal called an action potential. This is actually known as a photochemical reaction. The light is being absorbed by the rhodopsin, just like chlorophyll absorbs light energy, and that creates this uh, generation of an electrical signal. Now, what is rhodopsin? Rhodopsin is actually made up of two chemicals. It is made up of a protein called opsin. That's cute. Rhodopsin contains a protein called opsin. But attached to the opsin protein is a chemical called retinol. And you might say, what's retinol? We covered it a couple of class meetings ago. It's vitamin A. That's the chemical name for vitamin A. So now you know we, uh, why we need vitamin A. <laughs> vitamin A is a retinol, and it's called retinol because it's a chemical in the rod photoreceptors of the retina. Uh, it is needed in order for us to see. It acts as a coenzyme for this chemical reaction, and uh, as a coenzyme. But specifically, vitamin A is needed in order for the rod photoreceptors to work and allow us to see in dim light. So if you don't get enough vitamin A, if you have a deficiency, then your rod photoreceptors are going to have trouble working, and your difficulty in seeing is primarily going to be at night. And we call it a deficiency in vitamin A that it creates a condition called night blindness. Remember we said that? Because uh, we need the vitamin A uh, or retinol in order for our rod photoreceptors to allow us to see at night. It's not so much of a problem seeing during the daytime. Let me also show you another interesting relationship looking at the bottom of the page. At the bottom of the page is the chemical structure of vitamin A or retinol. Certainly I'm not asking you to know it. That's vitamin A or retinol. Now, What's the chemical that makes carrots look orange? Carotene. Carotene, right? We had talked about it higher up on the page. So that's what makes carrots look orange. This is carotene or beta carotene right here. That's what carotene looks like that looks orange. Look what happens when carotene is split in half right here. You know what it forms? Two vitamin A molecules. So carrots are an excellent source of vitamin A because carotene, when split in half, forms two vitamin A's. And so a lot of us have heard that carrots are good for vision. Well, in fact, what's good for vision, especially preventing night blindness, is vitamin A. And carotene is simply when you eat carrots containing carotene, the carotene is split in half. That's an excellent source of vitamin A or beta or retinol. Okay, so now you know how that works. Let's talk a little bit about the cone photoreceptors. There are three types of cone photoreceptors uh, based upon the colors of light they are activated by. So uh, we, had, uh, we had learned chlorophyll is activated especially by violet blue light, right? This is, and it, it, what, it doesn't, uh, what it doesn't absorb, it reflects. So there are three different chemicals in the three different types of cone photoreceptors. They contain chemicals different than rhodopsin. I'm not going to ask you to know their, those, those chemicals in the cone photoreceptors. I am asking you to know about rhodopsin in the rod photoreceptors. The chemicals that are found in the cones are known as iodopsins. I won't ask you to know that. But there are three different chemicals. In some uh, of our cones, they are activated by blue light. Other cones are activated by red light, and the third type of cone is activated by green light. So, by activating these three types of cone photoreceptors to different degrees, we are able to see all the colors of the rainbow. Because, uh, obviously, uh, let's say a color, color like purple. Purple will activate, to some extent, both the blue and the red cones. So it's a combination. And in case you're wondering, how could just three cones allow us to see all these different colors? Let me remind you of two things. First, uh, I don't know, if you ever take a magnifying lens and look at a TV monitor or a computer monitor, you'll see little round pixels. 
And these little pixels light up, creating the image you see on a TV set or a, a computer monitor, right? Do you know how many different colors of pixels there are? Three. Three. And they are red, blue, and green. And they light up to different degrees, and that creates all the color on a color TV screen. So there are different types of color blindness. Now, the gene that determines whether we have these cone photoreceptors is actually carried on the X sex chromosome. So this is considered what's called a sex link trait. Because it's carried on the X sex chromosome, and I'm not going to get into the details of how the genetics works. It's not that complicated. I'm just not going to get into it right now. But because of, uh, it's carried on the X sex chromosome, color blindness is far more common in males than females. Because uh, males have one X sex chromosome and females have two. So even if they had, a female had a defect in one of their X sex chromosomes, they've got a second one that might be fine. But guys have only one X sex chromosome, they're XY. And so if they've got a defect in that one X sex chromosome that they have, they've got color blindness. So it's much more common in guys. Now here's an interesting question. Here's an interesting question. Uh, the most common type of color blindness is the person can't, is either missing the green or the red cone, and therefore cannot tell the difference between green and red. So here's the question. Uh, I'll get to your question in just a moment. Uh, here's your question. Green and red are very important when you drive a car, right? Because there's green lights and red lights. So if somebody can't tell green from red, do they allow them to drive a car? They do allow them to drive a car. Well, then how do they know it's a green light or a red light? The red light is on the yes, they can tell what color it is, but they can tell it's lit up. The red light is always on top. You hadn't thought about that. So they can tell if the light is lit up. And if the top light is lit up, they stop. They don't say it's red. They just know it's lit up. And when the bottom light lights up, they go. Uh -huh. Obviously, this makes it more complicated, <laughs> all right? Now, they can tell it's an arrow lit up. They just can't tell whether it's green or red. You had a question? Yes. Um, when babies are first born, are they colorblind? Uh, yeah, the whole eye isn't fully developed. And in fact, the, the iris isn't yet formed, so you don't even know what color the iris is going to be. So there are many stages. Mostly, an infant is mostly aware of smells and touch. And their awareness, uh, slightly of sounds, and least of all, since vision, they have, they have their eyes shut most of the time. Their eyes are still developing and forming. Uh -huh. What color did they see if they don't see the green? All right, so that's what I, I knew somebody was going to ask me that. The question always is, well, if they can't tell green from red, then what color does it look like? So let me try to show you uh, this. Here's how they test for color blindness. All right. Can anybody see a number? Five. The number five. All right? But to somebody who has red-green color blindness, they can't tell this green from this red. They, it all looks the same. They cannot see that number. Is there anybody in this class who's colorblind? So nobody wants to say. Okay. There's a whole bunch of these. Here's, here's another one. Can you see this number? Seven. That's a seven. But they wouldn't be able to see that. So there are different kinds of color blindness. 29. So this is how they test to see which type of color blindness you've got. And you might be color blind to all of these. All right, here's uh, another one that's. Uh... Would it be to see the number to not see the Well, you should be able to see the number. All right. So you have to concentrate. So the, if somebody had the, the, didn't have the blue cones, that this would look the same. All right, so there are different types of color blindness. So you get the idea. Uh, here's another one. What number do you see? Two. All right, so that's how they test for color blindness. So uh, anyhow, that would work. So uh, we've been talking about uh, vision. So the point that we want to make here so far is whether we're talking about how chlorophyll in a plant absorbs certain colors of light or whether rhodopsin or these other chemicals in the cone photoreceptors are absorbed or activated by certain colors of light. The concept of how visible light 
is the right amount of energy, not too hot and not too cold, where it can excite the organic molecules, in, certain organic molecules in living things, like chlorophyll in a plant or rhodopsin in our eyes, our photoreceptors. It's not so powerful like x-rays that simply damage and destroy the organic molecules in a living thing. And yet, it's, it, it has, visible light has more energy than radio waves, which don't excite or affect organic molecules or living things at all. So therefore, living things are totally uh, unaware of radio waves, and they don't seem to affect us whatsoever. So uh, that, that's what we're saying. Now, uh, on the bottom of G1, so we've talked a little bit about this concept, and we've now learned not only about how we see, but also the relationship between carotene and carrots and vitamin A or retinol in our photoreceptors. 